This chapter continues our discussion of probability. We're going to focus here on different probability distributions, be they uniform, non-uniform, binomial, Poisson, or hypergeometric. And here we have two choice, two types of different random variables. Discrete would be a number that you could easily think of, that you could find specific locations along a timeline. Continuous is like uh, the values over a specific interval. So a continuous discrete variable, I'm sorry, a continuous variable would be the distance in miles from your home to the store versus a discrete variable, the number of dependents on your tax return or some sort of dummy variable system. You know, X is one if you do not have any pets, two if you own a dog, three if you own a cat, four if you own cats and dogs. The f of x is your probability function. So this is going to be your actual calculation of the probability of the occurrence of interest. So x will be the occurrence of interest. f of x then gives you the probability of that occurrence of interest. This is calculated just like a percentage frequency would be. So your numerator is your number of occurrences within a specific category, your denominator is your total number of observations overall, and then you're gonna convert that into percentage form. Now since this is a probability, it must by definition be positive and bounded between zero and one. Let X be the number of TVs sold at the store in one day, where X can have up to five values. Uh, you can sell no TVs, one TV, two TVs, three TVs, or four TVs. So we have a sample here of 200 days. On 80 days, you sold no TVs. So the probability of selling no TVs, f of zero, or p of zero, where x is zero, is 0.4, which is 80 over 20, or 40%. The probability of selling one TV is 25%. The probability of selling two TVs is 20%, and so on and so forth down the list. All of your probabilities together, all of the different possible outcomes added together, must add up to 100% by definition. This distribution is not uniform because the number of a occurrences for each observation is not the same. If the distribution were uniform, all of the values of the random variable would be equally likely, and the probability would be 1 over the number of observations. That is not the case in this example, because our occurrences in each state are different. On 80 days, we sold zero TVs. Out of our total of 200 days, that tells us that there is a 40% chance that we will sell zero TVs on any given day. Um, so think about calculating the expected value as the weighted average, where the weights are the probabilities. So here's our equation. E of x is the expected value of x. That's the expected outcome given all of the data that we have. That is equal to mu, the expected value. This is kind of like saying x bar, except we're using mu because we're denoting specifically here that we're dealing with non-uniform probability distributions. So the way you find this expected value is the sum of each of the observations times their respective probability, where f of x is the probability corresponding to that x observation. The variance is calculated in much the same way. It's just like we did in chapter three, except this time we can't just add up all of, the, all of the squared deviations from the mean and divide them by n minus one, because in this case, the distribution is not uniform. There are different probabilities of occurrence for each outcome. So if you'll notice here, our variance is calculated as the weighted average as of the sum of squared deviations from the mean, where the weights are the probabilities. So f of x is the probability of x occurring, and we are going to multiply that by its deviation from the mean. So the sum of x, your observation, minus 
mu, your overall expected value, squared. And again, remember, anytime we're calculating a variance, we need to square deviations from the mean so that deviations above and below the mean do not cancel one another out. At our first review question, scroll up here. A sample of 2,500 people were asked how many cups of coffee they drink in the morning. You're given the following sample information. So 700 people drank zero cups of coffee. 900 people drank one cup. 600 drank two cups. 300 drank three cups. And we add up all of those individual frequency distributions and we come up with our total of 2,500 individuals. So from this, we want to calculate the probabilities and hence the expected number of cups of coffee drank per day. So here we have um, this worked out for you. N is the total number of observations, the 2,500. My first step is to get the percentage frequency of the number of cups of coffee. That percentage frequency for each of those four possible outcomes also represents the probability of that outcome. So there is a 28% chance that a person will drink zero cups of coffee per day. How do I know that? There are 700 out of 2,500 people who drank zero cups of coffee per day. So that tells me there's a 28% probability of drinking zero cups of coffee per day. So probability is the same as your percentage frequency distribution calculations. Question A then asks me to calculate the expected number of cups of coffee today. That's basically asking me to calculate the average number of cups of coffee that were or that was drank given these probabilities that I've calculated. So E of X is my expected value of X. My expected value of X is equal to the sum of my X observations times the probability of that occurrence. So it's a weighted average based on probabilities. So I've already determined that there was a 28% chance that you drank zero cups of coffee per day plus a 36% chance that you drank one cup of coffee, plus a 24% chance that you drank two cups of coffee, plus a 12% chance that you drank three cups of coffee. I add them all up and I come up with 1.2. My interpretation of this is that the average person is expected to consume 1.2 cups of coffee per day. That's my expected value based on my weighted average where my weights are the probabilities that I gathered from this sample. Next we are asked to calculate the variance and standard deviation of this occurrence. So it's the formula is the sum of the probabilities, which are the weights, times the square deviation of the observation from its mean. So there's a 28% chance that you drank zero cups of coffee minus your expected 1.2 cups of coffee squared plus a 36% chance that you drank one cup of coffee minus your expected 1.2 cups of coffee squared plus a 24% chance that you drank two cups of coffee minus your expected 1.2 cups squared plus a 12% chance that you drank three cups of coffee minus your expected 1.2 cups squared. So I add that all up and I come up with 0.8368. That is my variance. It's actually in cups squared, which doesn't have very much interpretation for me. So I can take the square root of that to get my standard deviation, and I come up with a standard deviation of 0.9148. So that's the amount of expected deviation from that expected value. So that would be interpreted as 0.9148 cups is the expected standard deviation. Question C 
asks me to calculate the probability that a person drinks one cup of coffee per day. Well, I already did that up at the top. The probability that a person drank one cup of coffee was 36% because our percentage frequency was 36%. Out of our 2,500 people surveyed, 900 drank um, one cup of coffee today, resulting in our 36%. And I'm sorry, I'm moving the cursor, but it's not necessarily responding. So it's a little difficult to point out what I'm specifically talking about here. I apologize for that. Part D asks me to calculate the probability that a person drank at least two cups of coffee per day. So the probability that a person drank at least two cups of coffee per day. Well, we only have two observations that are greater than two. So 24% of our population drank two cups of coffee per day. 12% of our sample drank um, three cups of coffee today. So if I add those two observations together, the 24% plus the 12%, I come up with 36% of our sample drank at least two cups of coffee per day. So the probability of consuming at least two cups of coffee is equal to the sum of the probabilities of those who consumed two cups or more. In this case, the or more, the only other choice is three cups. So the probability that you consume two cups plus the probability that you consumed three cups. So now I would like you guys to take the opportunity to work through questions two and three. And I have the solutions posted for you here. So question two, you have the solutions here, and again, you have that link to the, a Word document with the questions themselves. So here's what I'm referring to for question two. And then question three, a similar, you know, practicing the similar idea. So you're given the probability distribution of a rate, possible rates of return, ROR, for an investment. And you can see I've provided answers for you. The probability that the rate of return is greater than 10% is 70 and so on and so forth. So in my notation, ROR stands for rate of return. Our next distribution that we will discuss is the binomial probability distribution. It has four characteristics. The experiments consist of a sequence of n identical trials. So you do the same thing n times. There are two potential outcomes, thus the name binomial. So we will label one a success and the other a failure. This could be the most common thing people think of here is coin toss, is it heads or tails, something, something like that. Um, the third property, the probability of success does not change from trial to trial. So there is no linking. It's not say, you can't say just because I flipped heads the last three times automatically means I'm going to flip heads again. No, each trial is independent of one another. So that idea is reinforced by the fourth point that's involved there. Here's the equation for figuring out binomial probabilities. X is the number of successes. So the probability of X, the probability of a specific number of successes is what you're going to be calculating here. P is the probability of success in one individual trial. N is the number of trials, and f of x is the probability of x successes in n trials. Okay, so you will be solving this both by hand using this formula as well as by using Excel. So the Excel formula is binome dist, the data observations, that's actually your x, comma, n, the number of trials, comma, P, the probability of success in one trial, comma, false. Why is it false? Because it's always false. So here's an example. Evans Electronics is concerned about low retention rate for its employees. In recent years, management has seen a turnover of 10% of the hourly employees annually. Thus, for an hourly employee chosen at 
random. The management estimates a probability of 0.1 or 10% that the person will not be with the company next year. Choosing three hourly employees at random, what is the probability that one of them will leave the company within the year? So here I have it, you know, showing you how the actual calculation is done. Now I'm going to skip over to another individual example so I have more room to actually write out the math. Because so let's look at a different question here. We're going to move on to question number four. Question number four says the student body of a large university consists of 60% female students. A random sample of eight students is selected. What is the probability that the among, among the students in the sample selected, exactly two of them are female? Our first step is to try to determine from reading this, what are our variables that we are given? So here, there is a 60% chance that the student is female. So I'm going to define success as female. So P is going to be 60%. There's a random sample of 8 students. So N is going to be 8. And then we can look at our first question that we are asked to solve. The first question asks us to solve the probability that among the students in that sample of 8, the probability that exactly two of them are female. So two is going to be my x. Now I have my formula rewritten up here and then I'm going to go through and I've color coded so you can see where the numbers are coming from. So the probability that two of our eight students are female is calculated in this second row here. Notice that the probability p is 60% and I'm entering that as 0.6 in my calculations. So the numerator is n factorial. Now I've worked first on just simplifying the second section of my equation. 0.6 squared is equal to 0.36. And then always remember parentheses exponents. So please excuse my dear Aunt Sally. Parentheses exponents, addition, subtraction, multiplication, and then division. That's the order of operations. So what I did here is I change that exponent 0.6 raised to the second power is 0.36 and then I went over to simplify the other side 1 minus the quantity 0.6 is 0.4 and then I went to simplify that exponent there it's raised to the 8 minus 2 well 8 minus 2 is really just 0.6 or really just 6 so then in my third line here um, I simplified this I took 0.4 raised it to the sixth power and then multiplied that by 0.36. Now remember if you're raising to a power you can either use the caret key on your calculator or can you can use the y to the x or x to the y key. Now let's come back to this factorial section. 8 factorial really just means 8 times 7 times 6 times 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. 2 factorial means 2 times 1. 6 factorial means 6 times 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. So you'll notice before my, my intermediate move between my second and third rows here, I simplified 8 minus 2 factorial, that quantity, to become 6 factorial because 8 minus 2 is 6. Now instead of having to plug all of this into my calculator, I can see that my numerator and denominator have a lot of overlap. So 8 times 7 is all I have to include in my actual numerator because it's 8 times 7 times 6 factorial. I also have a 6 factorial in my denominator, so the ones in my numerator and my denominator cancel one another out, and that allows me to simplify my numerator to 8 times 7 and my denominator to 2. I'll then multiply that by my calculation that I have here, my 0 0.00147, scroll down, and I will come up with 0 0.04128, 
or 4.128, uh, sorry, 4.128% chance that of the eight students surveyed, exactly two of them are female. Now I can do this same calculation in Excel. When I do things in Excel, I use the binome dist function. So I enter things as binome dist x, the observation that I'm looking for, the particular probability that I'm looking for, comma n, the number of trials, comma p, the probability in decimal form, comma false. Why am I entering false? Because I always enter false. So I will expect you to be able to do these calculations both by hand and in Excel. Now when I say show your work in Excel or if, show your work if you chose to solve this problem in Excel, all I'm really looking for uh, would be for you to write down this formula as you see here as what you answered. So this line here from binome dist to the actual answer is sufficient to count as actually showing your work in Excel. So let's open up Excel and work through this example just to get used to the general idea of it. So equals binome dist, open parenthesis. Now it tells me number S. So that's the X that it's looking for, which was two comma, the number of trials, which was eight comma, the probability, which needs to be entered in decimal notation, which was 0.6 comma, false. And I come up with the same answer in decimal notation and I can convert that to a percent. Um, so 4.28, more, sorry, 4.129% roughly. So I'm getting the same answer whether I do this using Excel or using my actual by hand calculation. The next part, question B asks us to calculate the probability that among the students in the sample, among those eight students, what is the probability that at least seven of them are, are female? So I have X and P of X. I start out with zero students, then one student, then two students, and I'm lazy, I don't want to um, keep running down through this, so I'm just gonna highlight and drag down um, to get my probabilities. Now, binome dist. In the first case, what is the probability that zero of my students are female? So X is zero comma, it asks for the number of trials, which is eight, comma, the probability, 0.6, comma, false. Okay. And I can highlight here and drag down, and it will calculate these individual probabilities for me. Now, notice I went to nine, there were only eight trials, so in that ninth observation, it said, um, number, this is impossible, we can't calculate this, what are you talking about? And I can also confirm that I performed that calculation correctly when I look at my probability that x equals 2, so I can convert this all into percentages to make sure that I see my answer here, I still come up with my 4.13%, the same as I calculated when I did it by hand and when I did that calculation in Excel previously. So if I need to calculate a series of sequential probabilities, I can do that in this quick and easy step. Now this question asks me to calculate the probability that at least seven of the students sampled are female. So probability that X is greater than or equal to seven. The way you calculate that is one minus each of the probabilities in ascending order 
up to but not including the probability of interest. So 1 minus P0 minus probability 1 minus probability 2 minus probability 3 minus probability 4 minus probability 5 minus probability 6. So up to but not including that at least number. Okay, so if I want at least seven, I go up to the probability that exactly six are female. And I can do that calculation, and I come up with 10.46%. Now, the next question asks me to calculate the probability that among the students in that sample, at least six are male. So be careful here. Before, we defined success as female because our probability that 60% told us the probability that the students were female was 60%. So for male, there are only two choices. If the probability of being female is 60%, the probability of male must be 1 minus 60% or 40%. So I can go back through here and change my calculations and change that 0.6 to a 0.4. Everything else will remain the same. I still did eight trials. I'm always using false in binomial distribution. And I will calculate the probabilities in ascending order that for each of these individual calculations. So the first one that this is going to change here that 1.68, that is the probability that there are no men in the sample of eight students that we selected. And now I just changed that probability from 60% to represent female to 40% to represent male. So I'm going to go ahead and drag that down by double clicking and that's going to change all of them, which is necessary for me to answer question C what is the probability that among the students in the sample at least six are male? So probability that x is greater than or equal to six as one minus the probabilities in ascending order up to but not including that at least number. So minus p0 minus the probability of one male minus the probability of two males, minus the probability of three males, minus the probability of four males, minus the probability of five males. So up to, but not including the six that I am looking for. And I'm going to get 4.98% probability that at least six of the sample are male. Other things that we can calculate with our binomial distribution, I can also determine the expected value. Okay, now here it's not such a long and complicated process because there are only two outcomes. So the expected value is defined as the expected value of the number of successes. So Remember, your definition of what a success is, is driven by how that probability is defined in the problem. So let's think back to the question that we were working on in our example. I'll scroll back a couple pages so we can rem recall the question. Evans Electronics is concerned about low retention rate for its employees, and we discovered that P the probability of an employee leaving was 10%. There were three trials, so N was three. Based on that, we defined success as the employee leaving. So I can go back through here and I can calculate the expected number of successes as N times P. So N is three trials and a 10% probability that an employee will leave so there is a 0.3% expected value. So 0.3 of our workers are expected to leave. The variance is calculated as N times P times the quantity 1 minus P. So N is 3, P is 10%, 
so 1 minus p must be 90 percent. So the variance is 0.27. Okay, so now after seeing this, I would like you guys to try questions 5 and 9. For question 5, do A by hand and in Excel, but then just do B and C in Excel. For question 9, do A and B, but only do them in Excel. And part C is extra credit, so I'm giving you all of this time until the exam to solve this question. And that will be five points extra credit that you can turn in along with your exam. So you would print out your answer or write out your answer, however you want to do it, and you would turn that in at the start of the exam. The distribution we're going to discuss is the Poisson distribution. It's useful in estimating the number of occurrences over a specified interval in time or space. It's a discrete random variable that we may assume has an infinite sequence of values. So 0, 1, 2, 3. This isn't something where we're looking at potential fractions. These are actual examples of observations. So the textbook gives some kind of odd examples. Um, the number of knots in a pine board, the number of vehicles passing through a toll booth in an hour, the number of people you see walk by your house within a given hour or half hour, something like that. What's unique about a Poisson distribution is that the mean and the variance are equal. Pay very attention, very close attention to that because this is why it gets its whole other uh, formula for doing this calculation. The mean and the variance are equal. These distributions have two properties. The probability of occurrence is the same for any two intervals of equal length and the occurrence or non-occurrence in any interval is independent of the occurrence or non-occurrence in any other interval. So just because X happened before doesn't mean that Y will happen now. It's equally likely that it could be X, Y, or Z, any of the potential acceptable outcomes. And here we have the formula. The Excel formula is Poisson X comma mean comma false. Why false? Because it's always false. Okay, so x, the number of occurrences within the interval, or the probability that you're solving for, f of x, the probability of x occurrences within that interval, mu, the mean number of occurrences within that interval, which is also equal to the variance, because in a Poisson distribution, mean and variance are equal to one another, E is a button on your calculator, so you will literally just hit the E button, and it automatically has E to the X. In most calculators, this is the inverse of the natural log function, so you might have to hit your shift or second key in order to access the E to the X. And then again, we're going to make use of the factorials for your X. So here's an example. Patients arrive at the emergency room of, Mer of Mercy Hospital at the average rate of six per hour on weekend evenings. What is the probability of four arrivals in 30 minutes on a weekend evening? Now, right off the start, they make this kind of confusing because they give you that average, that mu per hour. Patients arrive at the emergency room of Mercy Hospital at an average rate of six per hour. Well, if it's six per hour, then per half hour, the average would be three. And then it's asking you, what is the probability of four arrivals in 30 minutes? So that's why I divided the six by two, because if, my, if I'm looking for the probability of four arrivals in 30 minutes, I have to make sure that my mean and my x are in the same units, so I have to switch my hours to minutes. Mu is going to be 3 and x is going to be 4. So the probability of 4 arrivals is equal to numerator is 3 to the 4th times e to the negative 3 and my denominator is 4 factorial. So let's look at an example of this. A salesperson contacts 
eight potential customers per day. From past experience, we know that the probability of a potential customer making a purchase is 10%. What is the probability that the salesperson will make exactly two sales per day? That's A. B, what is the probability that the salesperson will make at least two sales per day is C. D, what percentage of days will the salesperson not make a sale? And E, what are the expected number of sales per day? So from this information, I can gather that there are eight potential customers per day. So mu is eight. And I want the probability in A, I want the probability of exactly two sales. So X will be two. Bring up this calculation for you. So mu, eight sales. So we expect eight potential customers per day. We want the probability that there will be exactly two sales. Now here's the formula. Mu to the X times E to the negative mu that quantity divided by x factorial. So eight squared times e to the negative eight, and that's divided by two factorial. Okay, so eight squared is 64. e to the negative eight is point zero 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 three three five five. Now be careful. You will oftentimes get this answer in scientific notation. So I'm plugging this into my calculator and I come up with 0 .01073. I can do the same calculation in Excel using the formula Poisson x comma mu comma false, so Poisson 2 comma 8 comma false. And I will also come up with 2 comma 8 comma false. And I can convert that into a percent. So 1.07%. Oh, which actually highlights an a mistake that I made here when I went to move over the decimal places. So this should be 1.073%, not 10.73%. That was a mistake on my part. I moved the decimal over three places as opposed to two. So I apologize for that error. Next, it asks us to figure out the probability that the salesperson will make at least two sales per day. So probability that X is greater than or equal to two. So probability that you make at least two sales is equal to one minus the probability of zero sales minus the probability of one sale. So I can go and do that individual calculation. So I'll set this up again here, X and then p of x, so the probability of zero sales, and then one sale. There's no reason to continue on to c to uh, two sales because my goal is the probability that x is greater than or equal to two, so I will only need probability that x is um, zero and the probability that x is equal to one. So I'll go and do those calculations. Poisson x, the probability that there are zero sales, comma, there's eight potential sales, comma, false. Okay. And I can just drag that down here. And if I like to convert them into percents, I can do that. That's fine. So this calculation, the probability that x is at least two, is equal to one minus. The probabilities in ascending order, beginning with zero, up to but not including that final probability. So the probability they make at least two sales is going to be equal to 99.698%. They have zero sales, so we did that. That was included there. So P of zero, probability of zero sales is 0.034%. And then uh, the next one, what is the expected number of sales per day? Well, we know when we read the question that the probability of a potential customer making a sale is 
And if there are eight customers that come in, then there is an 0.8 or 80% chance of making a sale. Um, so the expected number of sales per day is 0.8 or an 80% overall chance that given eight customers, we will make a sale. So now I would like you to try number seven. Do A and B by hand and then do C and D in Excel. Now note here, um, C is less than four and P is um, at least 18, probability that X is at least 18. So when you have less than a value, remember it's the probabilities in ascending order, we're going to add up the probabilities in ascending order, so zero, then one, then two, then whatever, all the way up to one minus the probability that we're looking at. So the probability that in this case seven is asking that you have less than four claims filed would be equal to the probability that you have zero claims plus the probability you have one claim, plus the probability you have two claims, plus the probability that you have three claims. Our next distribution is the hypergeometric distribution. Now, most important thing you're going to care about for this distribution is that I am not going to make you do the formula at all. You will see when you see the formula. Um, and those are in matrix notation and matrix multiplication. It gets a little complicated. Um, I will not be requiring you to do those calculations. So properties of the hypergeometric distribution, the trials are not independent. So one, the outcome in a previous trial influences the outcome in future trials. And the probability of success changes from trial to trial because the trials are not independent. So again, here's the formula. You're going to be using the Excel formula, x comma lowercase n comma r comma uppercase n. So we need to know what these variables stand for. X is the number of successes. Now this is just gonna be, be just like the binomial or Poisson distribution where you have to define what a success is. The easiest way to do that is to look at the way the probability is written in the question and define success as whatever way that probability is written so you don't have to do the one minus thing. So x, the number of successes, n, the number of trials, f of x, the probability of a success in those n trials, n, the number of elements in the population, and then r, the number of elements in the population that would be labeled a success. Important property of the hypergeometric distribution. x is less than or equal to r. Make sure you're writing this down. x must be less than or equal to r. And the quantity, lowercase n minus x, must be less than or equal to uppercase n minus r. These, this just impacts the math, and if you look at the formula, you can see where this is coming from. So oftentimes when you're reading the questions, picking out x, n, r, and uppercase n are the most difficult things. If you remember that x must be less than r, that's going to be your first clue to make sure that you have a question set up appropriately. So let's see an example. Bob Neverready has removed two dead batteries from a flashlight and inadvertently mingled them with two good batteries he intended as replacements. The four batteries look identical. Bob now randomly selects two of the four batteries. What is the probability that he has selected two good batteries? We want the probability that he has selected two good batteries. So we're going to define success as selecting a good battery. So x, the number of successes, will then be 2, because we want to know what is the probability that he selected two good batteries. n is the number of trials. Well, he randomly withdrew 
two batteries and replace them with two other batteries. So the number of trials is two because he changed two of the batteries. N, the number of elements in the population is four because there are four batteries. And R, the number of elements in the population labeled as a success is two because we know that he had two good batteries and he mingled them with two bad batteries. So there must, by definition, be two good batteries within there. We want to know what the probability is that he replaced the good batteries as opposed to replacing the bad batteries. X equals two, the number of good batteries selected. N equals two, the number of batteries selected in each for the trials. Four, the number of batteries in total and then R equals two, the number of good batteries in total. And we come up with 0.167 or 16.7% chance that he selected the good batteries. And solve this question in Excel. So we'll bring this up, I'm just gonna. All right, so hypergenomic distribution, HYP, and then I just select that one because I always type this wrong. Okay, so we need to put this in order. X, X is two good batteries, comma, N, there were two trials because two batteries were replaced, comma, R, there are two good batteries within the same population, and four, there are four batteries in total overall. So I calculate my hypergeonomic distribution probability of having selected two good batteries as 16.67%. We're gonna go through question eight and then you're going to practice with question 10. So let's see question eight. A retailer of electronic equipment received six HDTVs from the manager. Three of the HDTVs were damaged in shipment. The retailer sold two of the HDTVs to customers. What is the probability that both customers received damaged TVs? Now remember, you're only doing this in Excel. So lowercase n, two TVs were sold, so there were two trials. We want to know the probability that both the TVs that were sold were damaged, so we're going to define success as damaged. Uppercase N is the six TVs that were received, so we know that three out of those six out of that entire population were damaged, so R, R is going to be the number of successes within the population. We define success as being damaged, so if three of the six TVs are damaged, then R is going to be three. In Excel, I'm going to do X is two, N is two, R is three, and capital N is six, which is going to give us a 20% chance that two of the TVs sold were damaged. Question B asks us, what is the probability that one of the two customers received a defective TV? So the probability of one TV is hypergeodist one as your X, comma two as your lowercase n, your number of trials, comma three, the number of successes in the population, comma six, the number within the population. And that's gonna give us 60%. So we can go into Excel and we can perform those calculations. Click anywhere, so probability that both of the TVs sold were defective is two comma two comma three comma six. Enter, 20%. And then probability that one of the TVs sold was defective 1, 2, 3, 6. And that's going to give us our 60% probability. So I would like you guys to solve on your own number 10. And we have the solutions here for number 10. Now here, remember, you're only doing things in Excel. The hardest part, honestly, is determining each of the variables. 
But the trick for that, remember, by definition, x must be less than or equal to r, and the quantity, lowercase n minus x, must be less than or equal to the quantity uppercase n minus r. So write those down, check those conditions before you start plugging things into Excel.